David Amelech, you know, was the, you know, basically the, the, the greatest king. I mean, he was an amazing, amazing human being. He was a big tzaddik, big chacham. But when you read of his stories, you read his team, you know, he wrote most of the Tehillim. He wasn't the only one that wrote it. There was ten total of ten people that so wrote the Tehillim. He, he was one of them. He was one of the key ones. He wrote the most but amount he of them, and, and, he put, and he put it together. But one of the Tehillim, the first uh, Adam Arishon wrote. One of the Tehillim, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote. Uh, the uh, sons of Korach wrote some. Um, even though their father was punished, they did a tshuva, and they ended up becoming a very big tzaddikim. Uh, King Solomon, David's son, wrote a Tehillim. So there were several people that wrote Tehillim. And actually, Rabbi Mizrahi is, has uh, just started a, uh, uh, a series uh, just in the last few weeks to translate the meaning of each one of the Tehillim in English. It's phenomenal. I, I already watched the first one. It's fantastic. You have to watch it. Really, he's really, really amazing. Oh, he sent me a video and I was supposed to watch it. Remember? Which, yes. But... I changed the phone and then I have, so when you have a chance. I have a package for you before you go with a bunch of things I want you to listen to and watch because this is going to be your homework every day. Listen to something. You have to listen to something. Connect to a show every day. CDs. Yeah, yeah, listen, mm -hmm. watch something, connect to it. Sometimes a book is not the most convenient because even though, like I, Baruch Hashem, I just finished this book. Nice. And it's phenomenal. But you know what? It's, it's not the most convenient. Yeah, it's in English. It's in English and in Hebrew, actually. I read the English version. I tried reading some of the Hebrew, but nice. I, uh, but the key is that this is something that I can do when I'm in, on my desk, I'm at home, I can read it, I can study it, I can take notes, and I try to take notes with everything that I read because it helps me memorize it, plus it's, it helps me learn it. You know, you start when, you, when you're writing something, like you're copying something, you're thinking about it again. So if you're thinking about it again, you're understanding it again, and sometimes you get a new meaning from something that you had a basic understanding of, you get even a more, a, a more extensive uh, and deeper meaning the of it. The Chochmah opens up. Right, so, but that's a book. A book is not the most convenient thing all the time. If you're at work, if you're on a truck, you're, you have a half hour to drive until you get to the next location. You can't read a book oh, while yeah. you're driving. When you come in the house and you want to put the CD on, you can right. put a CD that's on. That's the thing. You put a CD in, if, CD in the car, CD in the house, CD in a DVD machine or something like that. You have something everywhere. You always, you're always able to do that because even if you're busy, even if you're in the middle of moving, let's say you're in the middle of a job, you can put the headphones on and just do your moving. You're not going to be able to be as focused as, let's say, if you're studying Gemara and that's the only thing that's in front of you, but even if it's in the background, you're still going to get a lot out of it. You're still going to learn a lot out of it. A lot of the things that I listen to as far as uh, Shurim, is usually when I'm doing something, either when I'm uh, doing some type of work or I'm doing something in the backyard, whatever, I'm doing something. I always have to have something and I always get something new out of it. So it, it's just, and again, that could count as, number one, your shiur to offer the day, your connection to Hashem, your call to Hashem every day. And, and, and most importantly, that's something that's going to get you to knowing more and more of why you're doing what you're doing. Because I think that's really one of the biggest problems with today's people is that most, there are some people that do a lot mm -hmm. and some people that don't do anything. The problem with both of them is that a lot of them don't know why. The people that don't do it don't know why, you know, they don't know why they would do it, so they don't do it. The people that do it, they were born into it. And some of them don't really go into the studying so deeply. They just do it because their father told them to do it or their mom told them to do it or they just, they're little kids, they can't really make their own choices there. So their father and their mother put them in a religious school. And in the beginning, they have a very difficult time connecting to Hashem because they don't really know why they're even there. So they do it. And if you don't work at it, if you don't actually look for a connection with Hashem, then what you end up having is that you have this basic knowledge, but you don't actually know why you're doing all of it. So these lectures uh, that you listen to, a lot of them, if it's, if it's the right ones, and especially, like I said, I keep mentioning the same rabbis because I think they're phenomenal, and I've listened to quite a few different rabbis, is because they teach you why you're doing it. Why to keep Shabbat? Why to do tefillin? Why to keep kashu? What's the big deal? So here's what we talked about before, and I think something we talked about last week is about kosher. So I'll tell you from my own personal story, you know, most of my life I ate kosher meat. But... I would eat non-kosher, you know, uh, dairy food or pasta. 
That was the, I think I was one of many people that was doing that. Saying, oh, no, 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 Rabbi, no, I eat kosher. Rabbi asked me, oh, you eat kosher? Yeah, yeah, I eat kosher. Oh, okay, upset. But in reality, I'm not eating kosher. Why? Because, and, and, and the funny thing is, I'm only learning this after the fact. So I decided eventually, obviously, as I became more and more religious, I realized, listen, I can't not keep, I have to keep everything. Mm -hmm. You can't do half of the job. It's either you're doing all of it or you do none of it. You, know, you can't just build half the bridge and expect people to cross it. It's either you build the whole bridge or you, or you don't bridge, you build anything. Right. So initially I just did it because I said, okay, you know what? I just have to do it. That's it. But then, Baruch Hashem, he gave me the insight to learn about these different foods and how they start making them. So you eat pizza, regular place, not kosher place. Right, right. Now you have five different pizzerias next to each other. None of them are kosher. They all use the same basic ingredients. You have cheese, you have bread, you have tomato sauce. It's the basic ingredients. But somehow, somehow, the taste of all five pizzas is not the same. It's different. One guy is this way, one guy is that way, and it's not the bread. It's the sauce. But how could tomato sauce taste so different? Okay, he's using garlic, so is he's using garlic. He's using onions, he's using onions. He's using something else, he's using... Still, again, it's still the same basic stuff. How? When you find out, and you can even ask any pizzeria this, what's the number one most tasty thing that they put into the sauce to give it the taste? The jelly. Chazil. Chazil. They actually put pork. So that sauce, you only see the tomato part. Yeah, thinking it's only the, tomato. You think Mar it's only tomato. Mar 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 what they're cooking Mar it Mar in... Marinara. marinara. But they're cooking it with pork. Same thing with a lot of different dressings. A lot of different food. Uh, like, uh, I just found out the other day. Um, uh, what is it called? Uh, the, um, the dressing for salads? Dressings. Also, the, uh, the soup. Soups. I used to eat soups. I used to go to the, the, uh, the soup with the onion soup and the cheese. What is it called? Oh. Um... Like uh, ready to go, like uh, like on, it's like it's like in uh, plastic cups. No, no, no. It's uh, well, there's minestrone soup. There's uh, different types of soups. Oh, okay. So the, now most of these soups, there there's vegetables in them, or there's no there's no meat in them, but and they're tasty. So I would go to different non kosher restaurants, and I would have these soups. I'm okay. like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not eating meat. I mean, what's the what's the the gives taste, them all the yeah, taste? Well, they cook it with bacon. Well. But you don't see the bacon, because they just cook it with it. They don't give you the bacon. So you don't realize that in reality. Yeah, because that's one of the things about, about the animal pig that's most unique about it, that's actually most disgusting, too, at the same time. It doesn't sweat. It does not sweat. So, see, I remember. Uh, right, so it doesn't sweat. When it doesn't sweat, it keeps all the flavor, but at the same time, it also keeps all the diseases. Uh, so on the health perspective, it's terrible for you. Right. On a taste perspective, it's supposed to be one that's of the why, most tasty That's why animals. Hashem uh, said not to eat this because... Right. So now, it's, uh, but, it's, but Hashem also to told us something very, very special. He told us, He promised us that there's for everything that you're not allowed to have, I'm going to give you something that's equivalent that you are allowed to have. So, bacon is supposed to be one of the most tasty meats out there. So, there's nothing else like it. Mm -hmm. That's what we complained about for many years. But Shev said, no, there is something. There's a fish called shibuta. Shibuta that uh, is uh, very, very common in different parts of the world. Shibuta? Shibuta, it's called. In Hebrew, it's called shibuta. I'm not, so, I'm not sure how it's called in English. They say it tastes exactly like bacon. Right. I've never had it personally, but my cousin has. He says it tastes, it's, it's, a, it's phenomenal. It has a good flavor. Had, yeah, it has a good flavor. It says the same exact taste. People that have had both have said right. it's identical. Right. And it's a fish. I can't even imagine a fish tasting like meat. Shibuta. Shibuta, that's what it's called. And it said, for everything that we're not allowed to have, there is something that we are allowed to have that will be the same. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, there's actually one of the... Um, Shimmy, with the fish. Yeah. This fish, like tilapia, salmon, like anything with scale is not allowed. Oh, no, everything, everything. With scale, we're allowed. Any fish that has fins and scales, you're allowed to have. 
fins and scales. Fins and scales. Anything, Anything that just no has scales. fins but no scales, you're not allowed to have. It also means that anything that the Gemara teaches us that any fish that has scales will always have fins. But any fish that has fins, fins doesn't necessarily have scales. scales. And that's actually one of the proofs that the Torah is divine, that it came from Hashem. Because this is written in the Torah. And the beauty of it is that Hashem told us, listen, I created millions of species. You know, we've documented over two million species inside the ocean. Two million different types wow. of fish. Wow. And he says, out of all the fish, you're allowed to have, to have the ones that have fins and scales. Everything else you're not allowed to have. And I promise you that everything that has scales will always have fins. But everything that has fins doesn't necessarily always fins, have uh... Fins is the, 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 the things the on the side. The scales are the things that you scratch off. Right. You clean it, the fish right. off. So now here's the thing. No human could ever guarantee such a thing. To say that everything that has scales has to have fins. You don't know all the fish. A human being can't tell you, listen, go into the ocean and I guarantee that you're going to find a certain fish. How could he know? But Hashem said, not only do I know, but I'm telling you that you will never find a fish that just has the scales. You know, if it has scales, it, has it always has fins. And that's one of the proofs that Torah is, has to be from Hashem. Because no human can ever, ever make that guarantee. And especially now and nowadays, when we have all these scientific equipment and these scientists that are constantly spending their life to try to prove the Torah wrong. They're always, they're always looking for something wrong. And they're always, they're always, always agreeing. Right, the, always have the to agree. In the end, they're always agreeing with the they're Torah. saying, you know what? It says it in the Torah, and we just discovered this uh, recently. And yeah, they the finally Torah caught up. They so finally many, so many uh, thousand, thousand years. They finally caught up. That's they, there's actually something I read about in, in, in this book. Actually, in the last couple of days, it's really, really amazing. There's a couple of things. Um, so you have. Uh, let me see. What is it? Okay, so one of the things. That uh, Einstein. Einstein was the considered Jewish, but very brilliant. Right, very, very, very brilliant guy, and uh, but not into the religion. Not into religion. Said so okay, but he was considered but he had the. A gift. Uh, he had a gift. Imagine, had a gift. imagine if you were got into the religion. What kind of tzaddik, chacham that he is? Would have been huge. Ooh, what? Uh, so there was actually one rabbi uh, that uh, actually, you know what, I have his name, I forget his name all the time. Yeah, I'm not very rabbi good. tried to convince him to... So there's one rabbi. Oh, that's what you're trying to tell me? There's one rabbi, true story. Um, I'll get you, I actually even have his picture. It's a very famous, uh, very famous chacham. There you go, one second. That's also good. I'm glad I met Daniel, you know? Yeah, he's a nice kid. He's a nice kid. And, I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking. You know, I was always into locksmith or, or limo or town car. <laughs> but you never know. You never know. Everything yeah. happens for a reason. So this guy, this guy, this oh, rabbi. I think I seen this picture. This huge, huge rabbi. What's his and name? A Roxover, uh, Roxover, something like that. How you say it in uh, okay. Roxover? He's from from Europe or something. Yeah, yeah. So he. Uh, this was when? when was this he? is in the, um, this I guess is during the 30s, the 1930s. Oh, right? Your screen is correct, huh? Yeah, it's correct. So anyway, so he was a huge chacham, huge, huge, giant chacham. So one day somebody tells him, listen, there's this guy, I, this guy named Albert, Albert Einstein. He's the, he's the gdol ador of the Jewish scientists. It's big, big chacham of Am Yisrael, why don't you meet him? He says, okay. So he goes and he uh, goes to his room to meet him. And obviously, people, some people were uh, excited to, uh, to meet him, to, to see this. So they go into a room. Less than 10 minutes into the uh, meeting, Einstein comes out, pulling his hair out. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. So everybody's like, what? 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 What, what happened? What happened? <laughs> He goes, I've spent my entire life figuring out the things I've figured out. He knew everything that I knew and he explained it in less than 10 minutes. 
Of all the years. Of all the years that I spent, he knew all of it already from the Torah. And he explained all of it. Things that took me 50 years to figure out. So he he was, explained he it in less than 10 minutes. He was jealous. He was like... Uh, so he's like, like I well, can't believe it. And he goes, he goes, he's... So Einstein's saying about him, he goes, he's not human. His genius is not... Uh, so the rabbi responds, he goes, if you think that I know a lot about the shtiot you deal with so much, come, study Torah with me, I'll teach you what I really know. Wow. The Torah has everything. Everything. And the more I learn it, the more I'm starting to realize that a lot of the things that people are saying that were discovered by scientists, you know, I don't actually think much was discovered. I actually think I'm getting to a point where I'm seeing so many things that are already in the Torah in such a plain way that I actually think that a lot of the so-called discoveries were just people read it there and... They knew that the mass public didn't know it. And they said, okay, it's my idea. And people believed them. Like it wasn't really, they copied it in so many words. So now this book, uh, it's called the Kuzari. It was written about 900 years ago. Uh, wow. And uh, it's a phenomenal story actually about a, uh, a king that tested uh, the uh, three major religions, Judaism, Christianity and uh, uh, Islam and he had these three people come and he tested them to see what's the true religion this king okay and long story short by by the end of it he, he realized that Judaism is the only true religion and he ended up not only converting himself but he converted his entire country uh, it's called Kuzali so it, hap it happened the actual story itself happened around the 8th century so about 1200 years ago Whoa. Uh, it was a nation of warriors that uh, you know that ended up converting to Judaism and became very very righteous Jews, and a lot of people uh, since they eventually lost a one big war, they ended up spreading amongst the world. So it's very uh, difficult to know who's from there and who's not. But there's a very very strong belief that the Kuzaris are also in Hebrew called Guzinim, but for some reason the Guzinim don't or Georgians are uh, denying it. They don't, many of them don't say that they are this, from the origin of Kuzari. But either way, the story is phenomenal, and, and it's pretty much the king knows a lot about science, Torah, and, and knows a lot about all the different religions. He's already studied it, and he's asking them different questions. So the responses are different proofs from the Torah of what we know, what's there, and so on. So you have a lot of different things. Now, Obviously, the rabbi here, it's uh, Rabbi Yehuda Levi. He is, uh, that, that wrote this uh, book. And um, he... Uh, he, uh, how, he wrote this book? Like, he wrote this book when? about 300 years after it happened. So it happened, the actual story itself happened in around the year 800. The book was written around the year 1100. Okay. 1140. So, and he got the story. Uh, Yehuda. Yehuda Halevi. <laughs> so now he got uh, he got the story from uh, from the so he's current a big, king, a big tzaddik. huge, huge, huge chacham. So this one, so now this 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 rabbi, he's, he's writing. You know, he's, he's it's pretty much this is the dialogue. The whole book is the dialogue between the conversation between uh, the three people, and mostly the Jewish guy, Catholic, and Jewish, Jewish and, Catholic, Jewish, and, Islam, and, Islam, and the king, and the king. And the king uh, liked the Jewish, and so he, yeah, he concluded, yeah, so he converted his, his uh, entire his country. country. Right, so now, so this, all of these questions are pretty much trying to prove which one is the right religion. Is it Christianity, is it uh, Islam, or is it Judaism? And, and based on, you know, facts, based on, you know, things that make sense, based on not just saying, listen, it's the right one because you should believe. I want to prove. You have to, right. you know, proof. Him, uh, proof is different than just belief. Right. So, so now this book is full of different proofs, of different information that we have from the Torah. So now all the information that's here, this is not the source of the information. This is secondhand in essence. So pretty much all the information the rabbi is providing, the king, he already got it from the Torah. He got it from the Gemara. He got it from the Zohar. He's got it from the Torah uh, Bechtav. He's got it from the Torah itself. 
So, but this book obviously is much smaller than the 25 books of Moses or the Gemara and so on. So, meaning, my point here is that this was a much more easy to read book than to study the Gemara or to study the, even the Torah itself, the, uh, the, uh, you know, it's, it's an easier language. So this was accessible to a lot more people than that, that could actually understand. Anybody could pick this book up in those times and even today, and, and, and figure out what it says. Because it's, you know, it's, it's translated in several languages, and it's you know, very easy to read. English, right, very easy to read. Whereas the Gemara, you know, not, until, not until recently... Careful, those are four. Yeah, uh, not until recently, but the Gemara, you know, the Gemara is, is, is a very, very difficult language. So not until recently, this last you know, couple of decades, the Gemara was generally in, this, you know, in, in a difficult language that most people didn't know how to read, and, you know, so you'd have to uh, uh, really get a lot of help to learn Gemara. But, you know, so even in those days, um, in order to learn Gemara, you actually have to learn not just Hebrew, but you have to learn Aramaic. You have to learn really a language that's, in today's age, no one speaks. Um, Very hard. And so, but today they translate it to English and to several other languages. So to say that, you know what, Someone picked up a Gemara and read it and then, you know, found that there's a cure to some disease or that there's some type of scientific fact in here. Maybe they didn't, maybe they just came up with it on their own because not necessarily everybody could read the Gemara. But a book like this and many books like it, that's much easier to read, anyone can read. So a couple of examples that I found is that one of the things about Einstein, one of the things that he got famous for is uh, another scientist got famous for in the last you know 50 60 years uh, 70 years is their whole concept of trying to uh, of talking about you know different about physical things about matter and, and, and about um, time which pretty much take all these scientists concluded that the whole aspect of time is only relevant if you have something physical meaning in, in the world we live in, since we live in a physical world, time is relevant. There's, there, we have time. We have 24 hours in a day, 365 days a year, and so on. But in the spiritual world, there is no time, because there's no, there's no matter. So that's, they came up with this whole concept, and they go into even more details, and so on. So when they said this, when the scientists... When Einstein and other scientists discussed this, like, wow, they're so geniuses. What a big discovery. This is so amazing. Da, 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 da. They could a big deal out of it. Oh, wow, gdola do, this guy. is such a big kacham. Funny thing is about this book is that he, he actually mentions it and in passing even. It's not even like a big deal. He says, um, is it this page? Uh, I'll find it in a second. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so he says, uh, so he starts explaining the, oh, here we go, here it is. Uh, so he starts explaining the whole um, concept of what angels are and the, uh, you know, and, and how they are different from us as far as that they are spiritual, whereas we're physical and spiritual. We have a soul and a body. They just have the, something that's similar to the soul. And he says it, listen, the, uh, in levels of the angels, uh, you know, there's no dependence on, there's no forces of nature, and, and there's, they're spiritual beings, and therefore they do not rely, they, they do not rely on time. Uh, there's no time, in essence, is what he's saying, because they're spiritual. So the point I'm trying to make here is that he already, 900 years ago, 800 years before Einstein was even a thought in someone's mind, already said, the Torah already told us that if there's no, if there's nothing physical, there's no time. But people that don't read Torah, they don't know this. They think that Einstein figured it out. And the same thing goes with this other thing. Now, in the last 20 years, scientists have been really, really delving into trying to figure out the brain. Trying to figure out how does the brain work. 
billions of dollars are being invested into the brain, trying to figure out which part does what, this, that, and you know, finally they're saying, oh listen, we're finally getting a hold of it, we're finally getting close to understanding anything about the brain, and we think that we know maybe 1% of the brain. We know, you know, brain is a, an amazing machine, we don't really know much about it, but we know about 1-2% of what it, what it what does. It does. <clears throat> So after all these decades of research and billions of dollars spent and thousands and thousands of doctors and scientists trying to figure out, they say, okay, listen, so we think that the part of the brain where the person is, uh, uh, his memory is, is in the front. The imagination of the brain, or the imagination of somebody's, uh, you know, is, is in the middle of the brain and the, um, uh, what is it? The memory is in the back. So that's what we know about the brain. Okay, so this has happened probably in the last 25 years, 30 years, maybe even less. All these years they researched, they finally concluded, this is, this is what we discovered. If they would have just picked this book up from 900 years ago, which this book, this person got it from a couple of thousand years before that, because says right here, very, very simple English. It says the cognitive faculty, which he's talking about, the cognitive faculty is the, the part of the brain that, uh, you know, I guess understands it can, and, and can really break down things to understand them, uh, is in the front of the brain. The imagination faculty, which is a person's imagination, is at the center of the brain. And the memory faculty is at the rear of the brain. And a discretion faculty, which is pretty much giving the person the ability to decide what to do, uh, they call it in, in science, they call it fight or flight. Uh, the discretion faculty permeates the entire brain, but the majority of it is housed near the imagination faculty. Pretty much everything they discovered in the last 20 years that they think is the most advanced modern science in history that really, it's already written <laughs> thousand years, years ago, but it's in simple English. It's not like a big, it's not like a difficult language. If somebody said, listen, it's written in the Gemara, or it's written in the Zohar, the Zohar is, you have to be a genius to even understand what it says. It's, you have to know the entire Torah to even understand it. A lot of people that are Baalei Tshuva, that are new to the religion, for some reason they're very attracted to the Zohar, and they try to learn from it. They try to learn Kabbalah, they try to learn things from the Zohar. You really sh shouldn't mess with it because it's a very, very high level of Torah where pretty much they say that if somebody has learned Torah, you know, from the time he was born until he was 40 years old, then maybe he's ready to start learning a little bit of Zohar. Wow. <laughs> so somebody that just became a Baal Tshuva and has only started to keep Shabbat in the last five years, obviously he's not ready yet. For the mo most of the time. Sometimes, so that's yes. how powerful... Uh, this Zohar, is. yeah, Zohar is very, very deep. But the point um, is... The big rabbi, rabbi, uh, rabbi... Some of them get into it, some of them don't. Not all of them do it. What about, like... The Tzaddik, uh, Baba Sali, and... Oh, yeah, they know that, that yeah, yeah. of course, yeah. Those, the huge ones, like the Gdola Dos, like Baba Sali, like uh, Rabbi Vadi Yosef, uh, you know, those big ones, yeah, they know the entire Torah. Baba Sali, they said that he used to cure you, like uh, if somebody yeah, he, was, like, had a disease or, or, or was sick. Or... He had, he had, he, he was the last of the high-level... Uh, what they call Kabbalists. Kabbalists, Kabbalah comes from the Zohar, and it's there's Kabbalah that teaches you about the world and stuff, and it's Kabbalah that teaches you how to do things. It's just an actual, uh, almost like a, uh, gives you the an ability to do things through Hashem, of course. It's not his ability, it's Hashem. Mm -hmm. um, but only someone that is extremely righteous, uh, big tzaddik, and most importantly, someone who has a real connection to Hashem can really use these things for, you know, uh, and know how to do it. In today's age, there's really not, uh, if anybody, there's maybe one or two people in the world that can do something. What do you want? Hold on a second. Oh, you want to do it? Yeah, he wants to do it. And, uh, and Mama Sali, like, Mama Sali was asked a few stories. He was, uh, he was always, uh, always finding him and, and uh, I was finding him sitting down reading uh, on the phone. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the big, the big, yeah, the big sages, the big tzaddikim, 
for them, the, the biggest ta'anuv in their life, the biggest pleasure in their life, was to learn Torah. To sit in their home, quietly? Anywhere they could learn Torah. So even, you actually see these pictures of, of Rabbi Yavadi Yosef, Zichonoli Vacha, and he was, one of the times he was in the... Uh, From Brooklyn. Uh, Rabbi Yavadi Yosef was in Jerusalem. Uh-oh. Uh, he, was, he was considered Gdol Adol. He was considered the biggest rabbi in the last few hundred years. He was huge. He just died last year. And uh, 90, Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef? Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. But Ovadia Yosef. Ovadia Yosef. Like Joseph? Yosef. How old was he? 93 or 96? Oh, I remember they had a big... Uh, biggest, yeah, the biggest... Uh, they came to the cemetery, uh, to the... Yeah, he had the biggest uh, funeral uh, gathering in, in since Moses. They say over a million people showed up. His uh, funeral swamped all of uh, all of Jerusalem. There's people who couldn't even move. Avadia Yosef. O V A D I A, I guess. <clears throat> so him, even in the hospital, when he was, you know, in his last days, there's pictures of him in his bed. You know, he's not doing well with Torah, reading, praying. Learning, learning to learn. One of the stories about Rabbi Avadia that's amazing is uh, he had a very, very unique memory, a very, very unique brain. He was a genius, but aside from aside from being a tzaddik, he was a huge, huge genius. Um, and uh, he had a photographic memory, but a photographic memory that's not like anybody else that has it. So there's one popular story. One popular story. Uh, one popular story is that uh, there was one journalist, you know, there's a lot of journalists in Israel, they like to attack, you know, when they're anti-religion, they like to attack the religion. So there was one journalist that uh, never met Rabbi Ovadi Yosef. No, and he's Jewish. And he's Jewish. They always have to say something. And he decided, you know what, he's like, listen, you know what, Rabbi Ovadi shouldn't really be the head rabbi anymore. I think he's too old now. And I think his memory is failing him. Like, you know, he doesn't have such a good memory anymore. He's, starting, he's, in that age. He's, he's older, he shouldn't, you know, he doesn't remember anything. But he had no reason to say, like, he, like Rabbi Ovadi Yosef didn't show any, any, any uh, uh, signs of, uh, of losing his memory. This guy just decided that if he's over 80 years old, he was like 85 years old at the time, then of course his memory should be going. Now, Rabbi Ovadi never really paid attention to journalists, but this one particular one uh, got his attention. So he said, you know what, you know, this guy wrote this article about me having a bad memory. Invite him, invite him to my house. <laughs> so the guy's like, oh, he's excited, sure. Go to Rabbi's house, big, big deal. So he goes, he gets invited to the house. Now Rabbi Vadia had in his house a uh, library with somewhere in the neighborhood, like some say 40,000, some say 60,000 books. Oh, he's walking outside. Come on, let me see. He's, he's 